At the time, you guys had to be thinking, this is never going to fly. I was reading the opposition, and it was, it was heavy. We are not going to approach this as proving people wrong. We're going to approach this as proving people that supported this project as being right. Anytime someone came in and found us, when it was their first time there, they're like, I can't believe this is in Fort Wayne. People could reimagine what Fort Wayne could be. So we just have that mindset. We want to get better. To be honest with you, I think we do a darn good job at it. You but do. there's always room for improvement. You're listening to the NEI Pioneer Podcast, where we showcase and share authentic stories of Northeast Indiana. This is a special episode because it's part one of a two-part series on the Fort Wayne Tin Caps. In this first episode, Bryce Vance and Jonathan Sackett interviewed two people who have been working behind the scenes of the Tin Caps since the beginning. Michael Limmer, who is Vice President of Marketing and Promotions, as well as David Lorenz, who is Vice President of Corporate Relationships. These two guests share how the Tin Caps got started, as well as their move to Parfue Field in downtown. They also discuss what got them started in baseball, where they draw inspiration for the Tin Caps, and more. Even if you aren't into baseball, the legacy of how the Tin Caps have shaped the downtown region of Fort Wayne is a story that you need to hear. So let's get into it. Hello, everyone. Welcome to the NEI Pioneer Podcast. I'm one of your co-hosts today, Bryce Vance. Joining me today is head of Marcom, Jonathan Sackett. And we have a special two-part series. Today is the first part for you guys on the Fort Wayne Tin Caps. And joining us today is VP of Marketing and Promotions, Michael Limmer, and VP of Corporate Partnerships, David Lorenz. Thank you guys for coming in. Yeah, thanks for having us. Yeah, you guys, we've got to know you just a little bit um, and reading through your bios. You guys have both been with the organization all the way back to the Wizards days. And now you guys have been with the organization since 1999. How did you guys get into your start with the organization? I'll let you go first, David. Well, thanks again for having us on. It's a, it's a great to be here, and your facility is fantastic, and we appreciate the uh, little pregame tour that you gave <laughs> no us. No problem. Growing up in a baseball family in mid-Michigan, it's always been a part of who I am, part of our fabric of our family. And uh, after college and graduating, I'm like, well, what do I want to do? Well, I followed my dreams of of, of baseball and sports not good enough to play on the field anymore but there's all there's other avenues that you can you can pursue and uh this will be my 30th year in baseball I, I know i don't have 30 more left in me but i'm looking forward to 2024 yeah so in my route uh i remember being a sports fan growing up baseball was always the the sport i enjoyed watching most i think the live experience was something that just got to me and uh, my brother used to live in Fort Wayne, and we came to visit him one summer. I was a, probably a sophomore in high school, and he's like, hey, my daughter got tickets through Wildcat. Uh, do you guys want to go to the minor league game here or minor league team here in town? I was like, sure. What are they called? They're like, oh, they're the Fort Wayne Wizards. And I was like, sure. And I sat in the bleachers way out in left field, and uh, we sat there, and I was like, this is crazy. Like, people are yelling and cheering for a free pizza from the mascot like that never happened i grew up in the bay area california so that never happened at giants games it was all about who's the left fielder who's pitching and it was just opened my eyes to there's more to um, sports and this entertainment than just like what was happening ball strikes and outs and so that planted in my head as a sophomore in high school minor league baseball could be something that is community oriented and about sports and it would kind of hit both things that I was interested in and so never thought I'd end up back in Fort Wayne at the time um, but went to Valparaiso University for undergrad and then got an internship with the Wizards and then I got hired full-time at the end and then a couple months later met met David when he came in um, and it's just it's been uh, more even more than what I was anticipating in terms of the community involvement, the the way that as we transition from the Wizards to the Tin Caps and move downtown to Parkview Field, um, just how much it just is a part of the fabric of Fort Wayne, and we don't we take we take great pride in being a steward of that and not credit, um, but just it's important and we feel like there's opportunities and responsibilities given what the Tin Caps means to people and what Parkview Field and the experience means. And so, you know, been there ever since. So since 1999, um, I did miss one year as I went back to grad school, uh, but came back, helped with the transition downtown, um, 
and just are really proud of what the, the organization and the city and how this community has kind of uh, rallied behind what it is we're doing and continues to, to support us and encourage us to do bigger and better every yeah, year. If, if you don't mind, it's interesting because I, we the, the team put together notes on you guys, so we've been studying you for the past couple of days. But you talked about uh, missing a year. I think it was 2007. Mm-hmm. Was the, yeah. Okay. So I was gonna, that was the question I was going to ask. But you touched on something that I thought was pretty interesting. You know, coming from Chicago, we've got the White Sox, we've got the Cubs, mm-hmm. which you guys definitely know very well. But I thought it was interesting, and if you wouldn't mind expanding on that a little bit, you talked about, you mentioned that it was more of an event that it wasn't just about the game, the balls, the catches. And my first Tin Caps experience here, since I moved here a little over a year ago, was we went down there for a team outing. And just the way you guys keep it moving, you know, there's the T-shirt shotgun or whatever the heck and the the, the races and all that other stuff. Can you expound on that a little bit? Like where you got your motivation from, what made you – because that's so much more than just a baseball game. Yeah, well, you know, I take a lot of – you know, what it was that kind of inspired, I, I would say, I'll speak for David too. I think he would say the same thing. I had a mentor who was here when I first came as an intern. His name is Bill Larson, who was the, the team president general manager at the time when I when I started and brought David in and Mike Nutter, who you'll talk to. He's our current team president. And his mentality was, I mean, it's cliche, but like the customer is king. The fan is about the fan is a hundred percent. How are we taking care of the fan? What is a fan experience? And regardless of, do you have fancy video board? Do you have fancy amenities? You know, that wasn't the case at Memorial stadium, the old home of the wizards. And so how do we make sure every fan that walks in feels like we are making, we are putting on a show specifically for that person, that family, those group of friends that are out And so that was ingrained in me from day one, that that was the focus and that's what we should be doing. We can't control who the first baseman is. We can't control whether we lose 15 to nothing or win 15 to nothing or have a walk-off home run to end the game. That is completely out of our control as, you know, we don't control the roster. It's minor league baseball, affiliated minor league baseball. You've got a major league affiliate and they send you who they are trying to develop to become future major leaguers. And so you focus on what you can control. And so we look at it and say from when they walk in the game, all of pregame, we've got at least 16 inning breaks. If it's a nine inning game, we get 17 if we're we're losing and we need a bottom of the ninth. So how do we fill those inning breaks with as much entertainment as we can? Because that's what we can control. We Again, the game may not be as entertaining as we would like it to be, but it creates the skeleton of that we can fill in of all these inning breaks and all the different promotions and how do we utilize now with the pitch clock how do we utilize that 90 seconds those two minutes um to entertain and connect and then and some people say i'll get up and use the restroom during the baseball game so i'm back in my seat for you know the the silly stuff that we do the well, dancing the fireworks, grounds right? crew make sure we're there after the game for fireworks and so yeah so it's really about trying to create that full experience of what we can control because there's so much that we can't and and so that's kind of the mentality that we take and I would I'd say I I learned and just kind of understood that from Bill Larson and I think everything kind of stems from from that and there's a lot of pioneers in minor league baseball that take pride in the the wacky and the different and oh yeah and the the unique things that we we can do and and I would say for us to be successful we need to do because if we just rolled the ball out to the mound and opened the doors and said, if you love baseball, come and watch mm-hmm. a Tin Caps game, that it, it would not resonate with the community and resonate with folks that come because it's more of a social gathering oh, place yeah. than, than it is where it's just like they're you know sitting there keeping score in their scorebook. And we have those. But yeah, we, well, yeah. We have more. Well, I, I and, and then I want to get back back on track here. But when we were working with um, the UFC with Dana White, his biggest problem was they tank as soon as you don't get a big name in there, and he was always trying to find a way to circumvent that because okay, you don't have Tito Ortiz fighting tonight, you're the pay per view is going to tank. So you guys were able to spread that out and make it more less of a destination, more of an event. And I thought that was really cool. I mean, having been to a couple games now, I love it. And another necessity of that is, you know, when you get a good player that's just becomes a little bit known in the community by nature of minor league baseball and development, they're going to be called up. They're mm-hmm. ready to move on mm-hmm. to the next level. And so you get someone like 
Fernando Tatis Jr. or you get someone that you know you're going to have him for this brief moment of time, and so catch him while you can because he'll be gone. Yeah. And so you can't say like a major league team can say, "Hey, come see Manny Machado and the San Diego Padres take on Aaron Judge and the Yankees," because they're going to be there yeah. for the most part. Free agency. <laughs> well, I was going to say, well, Sorry, the, yeah. the clock's yeah. always ticking, but still. Uh, but still, you can you can bank on your star players. NBA does it. Football does it. You know, because that's the draw. Right. And at us, it's like, come see the tin caps. Yeah. And come see the bat apple dancers and come see the, the dizzy the bat <laughs> race and come see the fireworks. Yeah. And hey, we, Kelly was educating me on all of, all that you guys do. And I just think yeah. it's great. Yeah. Come see Johnny, you know, there you go. You've, you've referenced Memorial stadium and the wizards a few times. And that's why we brought you guys in for, for this part of a uh, part of the series that we're going to do with you guys. Let's go back to 2006, 2007, you guys are both with the Wizards. Why was there a inkling or a want to move downtown? Well, I was at a, on a meeting in late November, I believe it was 2007, and one of my clients mentioned that it was in today's sports page. And I'll be honest, I didn't know I did not know about it at that time. And when he told me about it, I'm and I was pleasantly surprised. The past ownership group, I believe, set us up for success. And that all started with Bill Larson, who Michael mentioned. And Bill has a vision, and he had a vision. And his two years in Fort Wayne, along with our, our past owners, um, General Sports out of Detroit with Andy Appleby, he made the best hire, in my opinion, when he brought Bill in. And Bill's two years and bringing in some other folks and then having some seasoned people here in Fort Wayne – set us up for success so when we were able to bridge the gap between the Wizards and the Tin Caps we didn't miss a beat there has been some teams in minor league baseball where there's a there's a team and then they leave but then someone else comes in they don't have any personal experiences or personal relationships but we all had those so I believe that really helped us facilitate what we did and are still doing here at Parkview Field I know even before we found out as a team, there's a lot of markets where the team's the one pushing for the new ballpark. They're like, we need more suites. We need right. more of this. We need more of that. It doesn't matter the sport. Right? It doesn't They're... matter the sport. And so the interesting thing in terms of how this came about, and some of this learned after the fact, because like to David's point, it wasn't a team-specific driven thing. A for, former mayor, Graham Richard, uh, he had put together a ballpark plus plan of looking at other markets and saying, how did they drive growth? How did they drive development? How did they do this? What are, their, what are the, the common elements? And so, you know, they, they took city delegation to Des Moines, Chattanooga, um, Greenville, South Carolina, and said, what, are, what did they do that now their downtown is growing? And if the downtown is growing, how is the whole city growing, the vibe, the atmosphere, and how are they retaining you know, talent, young talent. In most of those cases, there was a ballpark, a baseball stadium, ballpark field in that downtown that was this catalyst for growth around it, for there being something entertainment-wise in their downtown. And and Graham Richard and his staff, all the, I mean, it never is one person, but he was kind of this focal point of, if we can get, we have a lot of people working downtown. No one's living downtown. No one's really playing downtown. How do we get the work and stay and how do we develop business but how do we get their interest in people to come downtown between other than from 9 a.m to 5 p.m and then everybody goes out you know there was talk about how fort Wayne was like a donut city because mm -hmm. everyone was out in the outer part and no one was living downtown it's the second playing time downtown. I've heard that in two days they're like well you need to give people a reason to come downtown after 5 p.m or come on downtown on weekends and I remember having lived in Fort Wayne. I was like, well, I come downtown. Do you count Rib Fest or Three Rivers Festival at downtown at Headwaters Park? Yeah, it's part of the footprint, but it wasn't Ish. like, yeah. yeah, it wasn't like the thing. Yeah. And there at the time, there was no river to the river was hidden because it was the it was a scary place for there's going to be floods, <laughs> you know, yes. or the water quality right. wasn't quite there. Right. So even as residents of Fort Wayne for 10 years before there was parkview field downtown was like kind of went you went mm -hmm. you know parked outside club soda went in ate went back home yeah and and so he had this vision of how these other markets and these other communities have thrived and around 
this being one of many pieces. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, Jason Fryer, who's the uh, team owner of the of the tin caps, you know, he would say he sat down, you know, Mayor Richard sat down with him and said up at the top of um, one of the tall buildings in downtown and looked down at where Parkview Field was going to be. He's like, can you envision a ballpark being there? Because I can. And Jason's like, this seems like something we would want to be a part of. But it was a it was a city driven initiative to say, how can this be a part of this bigger catalyst? And so the ballpark, which was part of the, the Harrison Square project, right. not only that little component of downtown, but how this could ripple and has been amazing over the last 15 years to see just down the Harrison corridor where you go the ash brokerage building and then the landing and the promenade park and even continued riverfront development how it has just lit and then over to electric, electric works, works down right. to the to the yep. south of us just how all these things have just rippled and again not because of a ballpark but because i would i will personally say take my tin cap hat off people could reimagine what fort wayne could be because they saw park v field and i would say david and i could both lost count of how many people walked into that ballpark whether it was an open house before the before the first season or anytime someone came in and found us that we knew and it was their first time there they're like i can't believe this is in fort wayne yeah yeah and that is something where we just said that is great to hear but fort wayne already has a lot of great things yeah and deserve that we don't have to play second fiddle to Mm -hmm. to these two other big cities like fort wayne can have these things and and i think it allowed people to reimagine what is possible in this area and and we take great pride in trying to maintain the not only a, the attendance but also the the success of the team because we want to continue to people say this is not just a flash in the pan one season yeah it's new people are curious but the fact that we continue to increase attendance after that first year for you know a decade plus now mm-hmm. you know, that that takes a tremendous amount of pride in we want to continue what Graham Richard and what this city thought this could be. Well, you you know it's interesting because you're talking about catalyst. We what NEI does is economic development, mm-hmm. which you guys know. And I think it's because you said the word catalyst, uh, you're absolutely right. It's it was interesting to me to go back in time and read uh, some of the opposition that you guys had to mm-hmm. face. You know, now it's easy. We, you know, we had site selectors come through a couple months ago, and they were looking out the windows in awe of our office and saying, I can't believe it. I was here eight years ago. This doesn't look like the same city. Yeah. And I didn't live here. So to me, it was like a sentence. Okay. You know, now you start to look at it through their lens. And I'm just wondering if you wouldn't mind talking a little bit about the opposition that you guys faced and what you think the turning point was, because it's easy now in hindsight to say, well, yeah, now we've got a ballpark. Now we've got, I live at Promenade. So now we've got parks, we've got all these things to do, electric works, uh, these eclectic uh, venues. Uh, you know, you've got neat things going on. But at the time, you guys had to be thinking, this is never going to fly. They're not going to do this. They're not. I mean, because I was reading the opposition and it was it was heavy. David, why don't you take take it first? First well, part. I just want to feed off what Michael said a few minutes ago. The visionary of our leadership back with Mayor Richards and our owner Jason Fryer has set up the team for success for a long term. And I also want to just mention that our staff, up and down our hallway, we've got 32 full-time staff. At least 12 of us have been there for 15 plus years. Oh, that's so rare. And to have the consistency of our staff is what I feel has, makes us successful. Michael's in charge of marketing. I know it's going to work out perfect. He's got some great people in his groups. I'm in charge of the corporate partnerships. I've got some great people on my side. And we focus on what we need to focus on. And if you need to be brought into another meeting to give your input, input is always encouraged. And again, without the people up and down both of our hallways, not just in the food and beverage area, but in our main office, to me, that's what makes the Fort Wayne tin caps go. Michael mentioned in 2009, great attendance. Once that year's over, we flip to the next year. Same thing. Once 2023 is over, Michael and his team are putting together a great game plan for all the promotions for 66 games. 
partnerships. We start in mid-May already for next year. So we just have that mindset. We want to get better. And to be honest with you, I think we do a darn good job at it. You but do. there's always room for improvement. Yeah. I, I would answer your question to, to David to tie in what David had just said about inertia. And I think we have inertia now that is moving forward. The momentum is there for us to say, how do we bet? We're already moving. How do we build on next year? And it, it, not to tuck on, touch on COVID, but we lost a season. Mm-hmm. And I think that that was really just one, uh, one season. And then the next year was, was abbreviated and with some, we started late, less games, some social distance seating, zip tied seats. I, don't want to relive all the all the all the fun. <laughs> None like, of us do. Uh, Nobody does we, it, yeah. we certainly not. You know, some zip tied seats compared to some other the health concerns going on certainly is not not the same. But just in terms of the impact to us professionally and personally, because David and I both put a lot of our heart and soul and and uh, into what we do. But I think the pause in 2020 brought us both back. I'd say we both talked about this of even stronger. In terms of what it is the tin caps could be because we we didn't we we didn't i don't say we took for granted but we fully appreciated when we came back of what the tin caps could be and meant so going back to your original question about you know the opposition and i think the inertia to use that word again was just still i just think change can be a difficult thing and i think the way that people viewed my opinion the way that people viewed fort wayne in 2005, 2006, was we are what we are. Mm-hmm. And there's, there was nothing wrong about what Fort Wayne was. There wasn't any sort of necessarily apologizing for what it was, but there was not the thought that there could be more or that there could be, uh, that we could do things differently and that we could do something that was, you know, more downtown Fort Wayne could be something different. And it's interesting too, you, you jump back to 2005, we jump back to 1960 and you're like, downtown was like the place to be. And you hear stories about how all the shopping was down and Wolf and Death Shower and all these things about, you look at pictures of all these like cool, like electric cable cars going around downtown. And you're just like, man, that was just the spot to go. And people talking about, yeah, we'd go downtown and we spend all Saturday and it was, we'd hang out and it was the place to be. And then that's like, that's, you know, 40 years later, you're like, that not, that looks nothing like that to me. That's not my experience. But to speak specifically to the ballpark, I think the inertia of like, well, the one we have is fine. The one we ha- have is brand new. Why would we need to replace it? You know, Memorial Stadium, you know, I think you put, you try to give it some character, which it had very little of, and call it the castle. I've taken yeah. Bryce's word on that one. Yeah, yeah, you're like the castle, and you're like, okay, that's a. You can call I, it whatever you fine. want. And I'm not downplaying it. I don't it. recall a, mo- a moat. No, well, <laughs> when it rained, we when that get, parking get lot one, when it rained. Right. And again, I'm not to downplay it because, again, I had a wonderful experience there with my brother when he took me f- with his daughter's free tickets from Wildcat. I mean, it, it what brought professional baseball to Fort Wayne. In 1993, the first year that, there, that the Wizards played, it had moved from Kenosha. The Kenosha Twins was purchased, oh, brought to Fort Wayne, and was renamed the Fort Wayne Wizards. And the county built the ballpark so that there could be a place for professional baseball to be in Fort Wayne. And it served its purpose. And yes, it was cinder blocks and concrete and a plywood outfield wall and no no amenities and one set of speakers out in center field that serviced the whole ballpark and one glorified light bright that we called the matrix board that we could put up, you know. Limited, I don't recall you calling it the light bright, but it makes sense. It is. Looks this like is reminding uh, me of County Stadium in Milwaukee, yeah, if you guys <laughs> ever went there. Yeah. I grew up in Milwaukee. Yeah. so Yeah, I think just the inertia of like why, what we have is fine. And again, it, it was fine. And I think that the fact that, and I'm proud of the fact that it, it wasn't like a team push of like we need more revenue generating which you hear a lot of places yeah it was about how do we be how do we come alongside the city and this region that was really wanting to say we could be more and we can be more downtown and that's going to have ripple effect not only downtown but just across the the city and and hopefully into the region to to be better and i think that change is hard and i think that even though park v field was built with zero 
taxpayer, individual taxpayer money, people thought, oh, this is going to make my, it is all built off of TIF districts and all this sort of things that is all, um, and the owner and hardball capital put money into it as well to build what still is visited. I think at last count, Mike Nutter, our team president, he said, and then steal his thunder for part two. Uh, he's had, there's probably been over 90 people that have come in specifically to tour the ballpark saying how do we build our park view field in our in our in our region in our city in our community and the fact that we were going and visiting des moines and chattanooga and now people are coming to fort wayne to say how do we do what they did in fort wayne i just i can't be more excited about what small little part we had in this snowball effect and and inertia and building of momentum and again is there more that this region can be absolutely do i want it to be more for my kids for david's kids do i want it to be a place that they want to stay and build a family and feel like that they have not only you know personal uh, fort wayne's always been known as a great place to raise a family i mean it's got great this is just a great community with great people but do i want them to feel like there's also professional challenges for them here that there's growth opportunities for them to have a career that can start middle end in fort wayne absolutely and i just think that that opposition was built off of a uh, mentality of what we have is good enough status quo yeah and and a lot of of like um you know downtown why would you want to go downtown for for a baseball game mm -hmm. like and the mentality has changed yes and you asked I mean, about when did that change yeah. yeah 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 when that changed i think ev as soon as they stepped foot inside the ballpark and just saw the downtown skyline from a different perspective yeah. and the way it's framed and the way that you can just see all the significant parts of downtown there's a lot of different ways to see the skyline of of downtown Fort Wayne. And it they? brought a sense of pride. I'm not from Fort Wayne. My kids are, right? Mm -hmm. They were born here. But I think there's a sense of pride when, when you think of downtown. Obviously, Michael and I think first of Parkview Field, and we're just happy to be a part of it. Yeah. Now, were we, 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 we're we the start of it? That's for other people to say that, right? But just to be a part of it and to be a good neighbor and to welcome all these new tenants that we keep seeing pop up all the time. See the cranes down at the Pearl right now. I mean, just the the vision of Graham Richard has just taken off. Well, you guys make our lives a lot easier because as part of all of our fam tours and stuff, you guys are always a big component to that. And what's neat about Parkview Field, it's open every day of the week from 9 to 5. If there's no game, the gates are open. People can come in and give a self-guided tour. It's amazing the people that we'll see on the concourse. Hmm. Just on game day or a non-game day, the people are walking around. Hey, what brings you out today? Well, we're here for a baseball tournament. We're from Rochester, New York. Oh, well, welcome. You have any questions? Wow. So it's just those you, – you, when, you, when you get a chance to have those – conversations with people you don't know it's important for me and i know michael also to embrace those opportunities and, and welcome them to our city and hey when you get a chance i don't know what you're doing for lunch but the oyster bar is one of my favorite places go check it out yeah so it's just another way to have that welcome into your ballpark whether it's a game or not and that's i think one of the interesting attributes that we have as pioneers for the tin caps and not just the tin caps but parkview field Northeast Indiana and, and Fort Wayne. You just got two points for that. Oh, perfect. Yeah, anytime you guys can say pioneer, you get perfect. Isn't it like it's podcast bingo? Isn't there like <laughs> some sort of phrases? <laughs> yeah, it is now. Hi, everyone. We want to take a quick moment to shout out our podcast sponsors. Now, first, you might be wondering who I am. So let me introduce myself. I am Hannah Hannigan, and normally I'm behind the camera as the videographer, but today I wanted to be in front of the camera to shout out the people who made this podcast possible. Barrett McNagney and Sweetwater Sound are the two sponsors of our podcast, and they're both located in Northeast Indiana. If you don't already know who they are, let me introduce them to you. We're going to start with Barrett McNagney. As Fort Wayne has grown, the Barrett Law Firm has grown with it. Founded in 1876, Barrett McNagney is one of the oldest law partnerships in Indiana and it's among one of the largest just in Northeast Indiana. They have the breadth of experience across a wide range of practice areas to provide you trusted legal counsel where and when you need it. And Sweetwater is actually the one we were able to purchase most of our audio and video gear from to make this podcast. So if you like how this podcast sounds or how it looks, be sure to check them out. 
Sweetwater, the nation's largest, and I would also add friendliest destination for music gear, is also your one-stop shop for all things podcasting. From audio interfaces, recording software, mixers, microphones, cameras, and lighting, Sweetwater has everything to get your podcast up and running. Enjoy personalized gear advice from their dedicated team of sales engineers, as well as free technical support to get your podcast connected and up and running. Really, what's not to love about that? So whether you already have a following or you're still chasing the next big thing, Sweetwater is going to be the ones to help you create a podcast that everyone will be talking about. So if you're interested in either of these companies, be sure to check out the links in our description. Now let's get back to the podcast. Were there any chances that downtown wasn't going to happen? I mean, because, you know, right now with what maybe the the soccer team that we have here in town is is trying to get, you know, a place where they have their own, you know, field, you know, whether it's downtown or not in downtown. What were the, you know, chances of Parkview Field happening downtown or not? I mean, I I will say thankfully with our our ownership group, we've had the opportunity to from afar help with the development of a new ballpark in Columbia, South Carolina. The Columbia Fireflies is a single-A baseball team down there. They moved in there. Uh, And then now in Chattanooga, Tennessee, the Lookouts is double-A. They're in the process of of finalizing and also um, getting a new ballpark down there. And every process is different. Mm -hmm. And I think in Fort Wayne, I think there was – it was very, very – likely that the ballpark could have stalled if there wasn't a if there wasn't just the the concept in the leadership and the the city leadership's mind that this was worth it that this had so much potential to push through the the negativity to push through the opposition to say okay we have to we have to educate people on what this can do and there's always risk there's always a possibility that this could not be what they thought it was going to be. There always is. And I, I look back at it and be like, man, they put a lot of trust in us as operators because there was a lot of eggs in that basket of saying, hey, we're going to make this investment in um, this ballpark and what it could be and what a successful ballpark can mean to catalyze to what the next thing could be. But I think there was a real real chance that this wasn't going to happen because it could have been real easy at any point you have one of these city council meetings or open forums and people step up and you have the open mic and say why do you want this why shouldn't we do it and there just was it by and large looking back at it as also you know from time to time go back and revisit it because it's good to kind of be revitalized on like uh, re-energized about why it is we do part of why we do what we do is you know just they're like why do we need it like there's other things we should be investing in and the and there's other things that need our money too and I, schools or infrastructure or whatever it might be there's potholes in my street let's fix that before you put a ballpark downtown those are all real things those are all still real things now and so the fact that that this idea of a ballpark and it's just it, it's just it is a ballpark but the fact that it can combine with every other thing and great amenity that's in Fort Wayne and be able to be a place that people want to not only keep their business but bring their business and all the people that are impacted with the with those jobs, being able to raise everything uh, in terms of just what Fort Wayne can be, I I just think that they're um, we're just in a position to continue to grow. And I do look I'm excited about uh, what the last 15 years have been, but I'm excited about what the next 15 can be. And selfishly, as a citizen of this community and of my family being here, like we'll be able to reap the benefits of an expanded promenade park and and riverfront development and and just things that my kids now are going to take for granted and i don't want them to take it for granted from a standpoint of not appreciate it but this it's always been there for them yeah and that hasn't always been there and i'm glad that it is now and want to continue to see that growth and and development and private and public investment that that was great i we're probably going to edit all that out because you're kind of stealing my job so (laughs) anyway or making your job easier. <laughs> That's a, there's two ways to look at that. I wanted to highlight something that Michael said. Michael mentioned how the city of Fort Wayne and the leaders were trusting the staff of the Wizards to take the tin caps to the next level. Mm-hmm. It reminds me of a conversation I had with uh, Jason Fryer, our owner. He, he's based in Atlanta. He uh, 
came here for a site visit, Michael will remember, at Memorial Stadium. And I said, I asked Jason, I said, hey, I have a question. Why us? Why do you want to buy the Fort Wayne Wizards? And his reply was, David, your staff has been together for several years and you're profitable. Okay. I think that's the te a testament to what we're able to build and for the leadership of Fort Wayne and the city to see that because that, we're, all, we're, we're all part of this community too, whether mm -hmm. we work for Northeast Indiana or for the Fort Wayne Wizards and all the Tin Caps. And it lit a fire under me. I know it lit a fire under him and all the rest of us because this is what we do. This is our career, minor league baseball. So we've seen Dayton. We've seen Birmingham. We see all these cities get new ballparks, but we're still at the castle, which is fine. We know we all loved it. We all loved it. And, and my, my, my two daughters grew up there. To come down here to be able to prove ourselves as a yeah, staff, that's, that's interesting. Well, you know, that's, that's a testament to us because we, we have a drive. I mean, we, you know, 2023 is a great year. We want 2024 to be a remarkable year. Yeah. And then down the road, 25 and 26 and so forth. I love it. I, I just, the, the, the stories that you guys are telling us is a story of sheer will. I think you guys just willed it to happen and it happened. But well, I think, I think a lot of that has to do with who we are, our mindset, the, the, the Bill Larson's of the world who taught us what to do and what not to do. And we've got that drive. I know one thing you talked about, um, you know, where that drive comes from. And I remember, you know, listening to a lot of those public meetings and, and, and hearing about it and the polls of, you know, in the media about what should happen or what should not. And I remember just take, having just such a, a tremendous amount of gratitude for those people that would stand up and say, this is something this city needs. This is something that, that I want as a business owner. It wasn't like, oh, I want to take my kids and I love baseball. It was like, this is something my business needs to be able to continue to recruit and retain talent to Fort Wayne if I want to keep my business here. But we took the mentality internally. It's like, we are not going to approach this as proving people wrong. We're going to approach this as pre proving people that supported this project as being right. And how do we, that is a much more positive and encouraging place to come from, from a motivating standpoint than trying to prove people wrong. Because as we know, whether it was the backlash we got when we announced the team name after the backlash of if the ballpark should be a thing is the people that are the haters, as they say, <laughs> uh, they're just going to move on. It's a moving target because as soon as you even like can lock them in and lock them into a spot and be like, you complained about this and it didn't happen. Or we complained about this and this positive thing was the result. They'll just move on to the next thing, the, tr yeah. the, the troll, mm -hmm. so to speak. And so, but the people that had the faith that this could be something and have faith in the leadership that made it happen, we want to prove people right. And we want to continue to prove them right, that this was not just a short term, but a long term um, catalyst for growth of downtown Fort Wayne for Fort Wayne in general, Northeast Indiana, and that we can continue to be a part of so many things that now people can take pride in in Fort Wayne. I mean, we want to hear the stories of, yeah, we, we've got a family reunion in town. We're going to take them to Electric Works. We're going to take them down to Promenade. We're going to catch a Tin Caps game. We hope there's a home game when they're in town. Like, we want to be part of what is downtown. And there already were a lot of great things that people, I think, just didn't fully understand to fully take advantage of and now there's so much more um and we have to stay we have to stay relevant as a ballpark to be continued to make sure that we're a place um competing for people's attention and time and calendar michael just mentioned stay irrelevant that's that's the marketing folks who continue to do great promotions and uh where we were 10 15 years ago and where we're at today it's amazing to be a guy off on the sidelines watching those guys do their work because they make my job easier. Of course. Yeah. For you guys who traveled all around, visited other ballparks before, what inspiration did you take and put it into Parkview Field? Was there any minor league specific, any major league things specific that you guys wanted to bring in? Because we, we, were, we were joking around as we were driving right by the ballpark the other day. He was... Jonathan was like, it kind of looks like a, a mini Fenway. It does. You know, with the, with the I big, lived in Boston big, for a while. It looks like Fenway. Big left field wall and stuff like that. So what types of 
inspiration did you guys take to put well, in I'll, the Parkview I'll, Field? I'll take the first one on that one. My background is hospitality, mm -hmm. and and I believe that was the main focus mm -hmm. on how we can entertain. Because like Michael said, we can't control the left fielder or who's playing right. first base. And if the guy's good like Tatis Jr. was, he's going to go to San Antonio any day. Yeah. And uh, the more hospitality, the areas that we could have to entertain clients, not just here in Allen County, but within a 60-mile radius, we have six or seven group sales folks that that's what their main focus is, bringing in companies from these, you know, 60 miles away a radius. You know, that's thousands of businesses that can come here and see the crown jewel here in Fort Wayne and the surrounding community. Yeah, I think Jason Fryer, I think he, he added up or... or estimated 70 different ballparks that, that some collection of us either went to together or independently and looked at or over a course of time. I, I mean, there's little things like um, our field boxes in left field. There's 75. They're four top, high top, much more so. Pardon me, Michael, the Toyota field box. Yes, yes. <laughs> They're very good. They're very good. Yeah. Toyota.com for your next RAV4, right? Am I supposed to add the little tagline in there? So, like, that section of the ballpark um, – was completely, it's it's a high top table with four chairs around it, much more social necessarily than like four chair back seats where you're all sitting shoulder to shoulder. You're sitting around a table together, having a drink, having some food. And that was lifted 100% from Greensboro, North Carolina, the grasshoppers. They had that same exact section, went there and was like, that's great. We want variety of seating. We don't want everything just to be one big, you know, Roman Coliseum of like everybody gets the same seat. And then also, you know, you mentioned Fenway Park. Well, left field, they, and it's not 20, 30 feet high like the, the Fenway, you know, monster. the green monster. Yeah. Uh, we actually were like, should we call it the monster seats? And we're like, it's 13 feet off the ground. It's 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 cool, but like home run porch is what it's we want. It's a fun with. monster. Yeah, it's, you know, it's a nice cuddly monster. Mini monster. monster. Yeah. <laughs> um, and you then, had me at mini monster. And then like in right field, we've got the treetops. Well, mm -hmm. that was basically the same concept of the rooftop seats at Wrigley Field, where across the street, they've got these this bar bleacher structure that is... It be a part of the Wrigley experience outside of the ballpark, but we're like, okay, this is in the ballpark, but it's part of the parking garage next to the video board structure. And so, you know, and then our picnic area, which is again, groups and group outings and company picnics, that's, you know, bread and butter for us. And so we wanted to make sure we had picnic tables where people could come together. So, you know, a lot of bits and pieces from a lot of different places. Center field, the 400 club, US Foods 400 club, that <laughs> drop. Get my got my corporate <laughs> partnership person next to me, and the summit above it. Um, that's something that was unique that was never that I know of was never in any ballpark anywhere, minor or major league, where we had a party group area, glassed in, right in center field in the batter's eye. That we were the first one to have it, and we had to get a lot of like, okay, major league baseball involved. The glass had to be at the right angle so there wasn't glare to the pitcher, and it had to be tinted to the right degree, and lights inside have to be controlled to make sure there's not any distractions uh, but by and large you know which was something we added to the ballpark a few years four or five years after we opened so it was a, another investment from our ownership group into the ballpark to continue the amenities and con continue the variety of seating that we have but we take to say where did the inspiration come the main inspiration we talk about it is like neighborhoods so, like, people that come and hang out in the lawn, that's a different experience than the people that come and have a picnic together on, in the picnic tables or sit in our main seating area, which is traditional and is a vast majority of our experience is the traditional baseball, comfortable baseball seat, our suites, the club seats upstairs. We've got in-seat service in our uh, diamond view and in our field boxes and our club seats upstairs and in our suites. And then we've got the field boxes, home run porch. I mean, it was just there's a dozen different places I just mentioned, and we've got even more than that, where you can come to 12 different games, have 12 different experiences, hopefully all positive, all surround, surrounded and, and centered on the entertainment and the promotions and the theme nights and the great job our video production crew does on creating the visuals and, and immersing into the, the atmosphere of what we have going on. But piecing all those neighbor, neighborhoods together to make sure that we have a ballpark that if it's a 3,000 person attendance game in April, a cold April night with school school night, 
weather or 9,000 people on 4th of July, that that is going to be an entertaining and it's going to be a community uh, and social experience. And so in terms of the inspiration, you know, it's kind of, you kind of pick and choose a bunch of different places. Are you like, is this going to be like a Frankenstein's monster of like piecing <laughs> mm-hmm. all these things together? Yeah. Are they going to fit? Are they going to go together? Is it going to work the way that we want? And it, it really has. And we all are really thankful that the pieces that we put together really have served to provide that variety of experience, you know, depending on what you're coming to the game wanting. You know, are you hosting clients? We got spots for you. If you're bringing your family and you're there, you got a four and a five year old, and we need to be out near the splash pad in center field so that they can take a break and dad can still over his shoulder be, you know, watching what's going part of the game. We can do that as well. And it, it just is wonderful when people say, What's your favorite? Sorry if I'm going to steal a question. What's your favorite about part ask, what's your favorite? of the ballpark? Yeah. And it's like, I honestly can't choose. I honestly can't choose when people say, Hey, where should I, where should I go? Um, it's a hard choice because it's just, well, what are you wanting? What are you wanting your experience to be? Who are you coming with? Because I can give you two or three, depending on what it is that you're, you yeah, want your, your experience three to be. Three might be different than yeah. my two or three or her three and th- two or three. Mm-hmm. It's hard to say. How do you, how do you guys envision this moving forward? How it, you guys have evolved, you know, so much with the park and, you know, the adding the, the, the 400 club, then then the summit on top of it. And you guys are doing, you know, more promotions than ever, you know, just looking up at the, you know, the 15th year, uh, this year, you guys are adding more, you know, what's, what's kind of next, what's kind of, you guys are looking at a little bit down the, the road you guys are already planning for, you know, sponsorships next year. Um, uh, what's, what's next for, for Parkview field. Well, I'll start that one off and let Michael bring it on home. Our owner, Jason Fry, I know we've mentioned him before, and and uh, he's never said no to any of our wish list. And he's always put us in a position to be successful. Words to live by. It's, it's a challenge because you already start with something that we consider great, the facility. Yeah. And so how do you continue to evolve it and grow it and keep adding, you know, what's next? What's the next wow thing you're going to do? And, you know, sometimes we have big changes that nobody really sees because you're like, you know, making key logistical changes in the background (laughs) that are going to, you know, cut wait times at concession stands and streamline efficiencies. They're like, what's the, where's the new big video board? Where's the, where's the new big, you know, zip line that goes across right field? Like what, what are the new grand things that like people can hang their hat on? And it's like so much of what we did to start was just figure out how to do it. Yeah. And then we could, did add some pretty big things. The 400 Club, we did want, you know, added all these new video boards, you know, five years because ago. Because originally, Michael, the 400 Club was going to be a Wrigley Field type scoreboard. Oh. And oh, then, wow, like in wow. year three or four, Jason goes, hey, let's get that scoreboard. And we're like, no, we want hospitality area. Mm-hmm. So, again, he's putting us in a position to be successful. He takes our feedback. So, a lot of it is just trying to look at the, you know, the secret sauce, so to speak. And you're like, how do you continue to change, evolve, you know, cater to a variety of tastes that people have? Like we want to be for grandma, grandpa, and for the grandkids. Like we want to make sure that we are, no one has to apologize for anything they see or hear at the ballpark, which as a, as a dad, that has become increasingly difficult to find content that you're not just like, I can't watch this kid, kid show because it's, not all the contents for kids and so we try to make sure that we it's hard to be everything for everyone but we want to provide a lot of different things to everything from you know bluey is coming this this year and it blew up on social media i want my kid excited (laughs) yeah and it's like we want to do something you know we did something last year with the grateful dead and it's like Okay, well, that's another segment. But it doesn't mean you can't come on those games and still just have a great Tin Caps experience. Right. You know, we play a series of games as the Hoosier State Tenderloins just to kind of lean into the goofiness and, mm-hmm. you know, the tenderloin. The type atmosphere. Yeah, the, the, the tenderloin is a ridiculous sandwich. We can be a ridiculous, <laughs> you know, experience, yeah. you know, in a good way. So in terms of, like, what's next, I think we just have to continue driving to say how do we connect with the community how do we get outside the walls of the ballpark and make sure we're part of the fabric of what's going on and really invest our time and energy with people? And then also just making sure we continue to not just roll out the same thing every year and be like, well, they came last year. They'll come again. We have to make sure that we are we're listening and we are welcoming and we are inviting 
of the community to come and be a part of what we have going on. And then when we stop doing that, then the success will stop and we don't plan on stopping anytime soon. One, one thing that Michael said, it reminded me uh, about 15 years ago, Mike Nutter, our team president, instituted everybody needs to be a part of a couple organizations. So with 33, 34 full-time staff members, I know at one point I was involved in seven or eight. Wow. Now, since my kids are out of school, it's scaled down a little bit. But I think that's 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 also key for for us is we're also a part of the community, whether it's coaching youth sports or, or show choir. Or we have a guy on our staff who doesn't have any kids in, in the sport, but he's coaching football hmm. at a middle school. So we're all involved in things that excite us outside of Parkview Field. Right. I love it. We, we end these – these shows with a rapid fire wrap up questions. So just, I'm ready. and they're all tin caps themed yep. this time. There are so. tin get, since since I'm the oldest, I get to go first. <laughs> <laughs> I was hoping you guys would yell them out together and oh, then okay. get into a fist fight. Whatever you guys want to do. Okay, because right. you also talked about humor and things. So this first one, I didn't even know what my team was talking about when they told me this one, but here it goes. Who are you rooting for in the condiment packet race? <laughs> Ketchup, mustard, or relish? Uh, I'm going with relish because you can put that in. In tuna salad, chicken salad, you can put it on your hot dog. So I'm, I'm a relish guy. All right. You had me at relish. That's fair. This is a hot button issue. I was going to say, <laughs> we, a hot, we were told before. This we were is prepped. a hot button issue. Uh, My team prepped me. Can you tell? I was can ready I, for it. Can I, I'll get, I'll, maybe we'll get some comments in the, the comment section here, but I, I am an anyone but your relish guy. Okay. All right. Good. You're dressed, must, you're must, dressed in green. You two are polarizing. Must, huh? Mustard, <laughs> mustard, and ketchup. Okay. All day, every day. Best food stand in the park: the apple cart or the hot corner? Dessert first for me. <laughs> oh, can you tell? Yeah. <laughs> That's why I wear black. It's slendery. Yeah. You might not be able to tell on TV. Vertical stripes, please. Yeah. You know, I, I, I think from. We get a lot of opportunities to sample a lot of the food at the we ballpark because we we there every, and remember, every we game. Remember, we sixty six times, so yeah. it's hard to eat sixty six. Uh, yeah, can't have chicken know. tender sixty six <laughs> right. times. Well, I, you I, can, but some people have tried. The, the marketing guy in me leans into you know we're Apple logo or Apple based Johnny Appleseed inspired, so Apple Cart's got to be. Michael, this is a rapid fire. <laughs> yeah. This is, a, this is okay. as rapid as I go. I okay. gotta explain my answer. Fa- favorite theme night of all time. This is you rapid know, fire, David. You oh, yeah. Sorry. Time. I'm, I'm going yeah, go, to go with the, the Fort Wayne Daisies because just the history of it. Mm. Okay. I just love it. League of Our Own. Yeah. Yeah, one of the, my favorite one, uh, third year opening day, we did uh, tin caps in 3D, and we handed out 3D glasses, and we did all we did a majority of the graphics on the video board uh, in 3D, the old blue, oh, yeah. blue-red style glasses, and I still was so proud that we pulled that off, and it and it landed with fans. That was one that easily could have been like, eh. And we won but an it, award with minor league baseball. It, yeah, but it just we don't was, do things to win awards, but it's nice. Yeah, it was nice. It was just was really cool. Uh, that one was one I was really proud of, and and uh, glad we landed that one. That was a little bit of over our skis a bit to see if we could do it, and we put it on opening day, and we made it happen. There you go. Okay, last one. There's more on here, but this is the last one because this one doesn't mean Let's much. Keep to going. Me. I'm, I DJ love DJ Tin Cat or Dizzy Dog Challenge. Well, I have four dogs, so I'm going with the dog challenge. <laughs> I love DJ Tin Cat. I could not get enough of DJ Tin Cat. Classic. So no wonder you guys work DJ, so well together. You guys are polar DJ opposite. Tin you guys are the yin and yang of, of baseball. Yeah, we and haven't Fort agreed Wayne. on anything. That's normally how it is in the office. I'm not too. a ca- I'm not a cat guy in general, but <laughs> DJ Tin Cat it just has. And you have has, a dog. Has war- DJ Tin Cat. Okay, Cat's all right. Won my just heart. because of this, I'm yeah. gonna ask one more. Yeah. Just because you guys are keeping well, that, that'll be do five all day with Let's you two. We got to end in an even number, so two more. Okay, so there's no limit on podcasts. Okay, two more then. Favorite Tin Caps player of all time? Fernando Tatis Jr. Whenever I heard his name coming to bat, I stopped what I was doing to watch him hit. Really? He okay. Was, he's unbelievable. If I'm allowed to go back to the Wizards days, uh, I don't know why. I just was a big fan of a player named Dirk Hayhurst. He went on and actually made to the Blue Jays for a little while, but I just appreciated his unique approach to being a minor league baseball player he wrote a couple books about about his experience in minor league baseball and i I just i don't know it just kind of in terms of just kind of getting to know someone on and off the field that was one of my favorites but in terms of watching i think he played with paul molitor back then didn't he maybe right at the end of his career um 
but yeah, Tatis and then also Jake PV when he pitched with the Wizards, those were two people where it's just like I had to be watching every time that they were up. And you it's could tell you could yeah. tell there was something yeah. a little bit different about what they were about. I, I don't, Trey Turner, I think he was a little bit similar to that. Mm-hmm. The ball just kind of finds the people that yeah. that have that. And again, I'm not a scout and I couldn't have put a hundred bucks saying one or other of those guys was like this is a lock. Mm-hmm. But you just knew when he when they were here, they just had it and and sometimes you can see it when they're in Fort Wayne sometimes you can't and then they, they get find it later and they have a 10-year big league career okay last one <laughs> again this one doesn't mean much to me so Fort Wayne tenderloins or Manzanas luchadores did I say that right yeah mm-hmm. okay so those are two of our alternate identities the Hoosier State tenderloins and the Manzanas luchadores Go ahead. You got the floor. Oh, you, you said age, age oh, before age. beauty. That was why you said age, the age you and out. beauty. Let me retract okay. it. I'm going to go with the tenderloins because when I first heard about it, it got me excited. Mm-hmm. I like them both so well. Um, <laughs> you know, just to be contrary, contrary, since I do like them both, uh, Manzana's Luchadores was is a lot of fun. I love the logo. The, the Take our tin cap off our apple, throw a Luchador mask on with the little fighting, grappling hands next to it. Uh, I just smile every time I see it, and it just was our first non-tin cap alternate identity. Well, for me, the... the, 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 the uh... Not the merry-go-round, the Ferris wheel on the jersey, and then the tenderloin. Of the and, tenderloin, and the, yeah. The, the look of it. The, yeah. The, the, the Indian uh, Hoosiers. Like pants. Pin yeah. Stripes. Yeah. Yeah. I'm a stripes. Michigan fan. Candy stripes. Yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah. yeah. So, you know, the candy stripe yeah. pants. And yeah. Oh, I, the history. I love them both. It's like trying to ask who, what's your favorite kid. Like, I don't, can't pick one. But <laughs> Depends I on what pick, day of the yeah. week. I'm yeah. going yeah. to say, I don't know, man. Well, right now it's yeah. this one. Yeah. I'll give some love to the one you didn't pick. But, yeah, they're both great. Okay. Yeah, we appreciate you guys coming in. Um, like like John said, we could talk to you all day about baseball, the the, the ballpark. I don't I mean, think we talked about baseball hardly at all. I mean, we didn't. Anyway. Yeah. Hey, hey, Bryce, <laughs> Bryce could talk to you about I, baseball I could. all day long. Um, having worked for the Tin Cats before um, and being at the ballpark hundreds of times, it's definitely an experience that you know everybody in not just in Fort Wayne or the surrounding area should you know visit. Like you said, people from they're just stopping through town should should stop by and just go look at the ballpark because it's it's beauty and it's it's beautiful and it's just you know been a catalyst for the rest of downtown so we definitely appreciate you guys giving some perspective um on it and the story of bringing it to downtown so and thank you guys for for coming in and sharing the the stories thank you it was kind of like uh two two guys getting together with four college buddies and just having a conversation and we appreciate that well that's awesome. that's, that's our goal here so absolutely for jonathan uh i'm bryce thank you guys for so much for tuning in uh to the podcast make sure you guys subscribe apple podcast spotify follow it on youtube you can also go to pioneerstartshere.com slash podcast to find the latest episode there perfect that was fun